We're doing a call to worship the Savior. Um, it's a bit of a confession, a bit of a realization of our position in Christ, and then also orienting ourselves towards worshiping the Savior. Um, so there's a position for me to speak as leader, one for you, people of God, and then in the end, there's one for us in unison. Hmm. Yeah. Who did Christ come to save? Christ I came to save rebellious sinners, of which I am one. But why would God send Christ to save me when I was dead in my sin and not worthy of this effort, this gift? Because God is a merciful, covenant-keeping, and magnanimous grace-giver, who by his own pleasure sent his Son, Christ Jesus, to be sacrificed for my sin. Christ was crucified and rose from the grave and has satisfied the punishment of my sin. And I hear this truth, but I battle to live a life that expresses a genuine response of worship and obedience. Why is this? In my flesh, I continue to sin. My spirit, though I'm is in a constant state of war with my flesh. I have died with Christ. I have been raised and hidden with Christ. Yet I must battle my own sin. Help me, Lord, Spirit of God, aid in my God. And in unison, today, help us, Lord. Lord. We desire to see our sins you see it, in a bigger siphoning agent of separation from you. Aid us in mortifying our indwelling sin in order that we might worship in a manner worthy of our calling. Obey more consistently. Live in love with a clear conscience. Stand for truth and justice and see our neighbors as you see them valuable and their needs as our own. Lord, you have called us to be worshipers. Help us live in practice what you have made us in Christ. Thank you, Mary. Did you notice the set began the same way as it ended? On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye, and then it ends with as I journey home to see him. So thank you, team. Uh, for all of your work, all of your planning to bring uh, the truth and the hope of the gospel to us in song. I promised that someday here I would show you verses, I would show you why verses like Psalm 147 verse 2 where the Hebrew Bible uses the word tov, good, uh, one of the most powerful words in the Hebrew Bible, which I will be reading from in just a minute, why it says it is good to sing praises to your name. Uh, from the research of the human body, uh, the way our body is put together, the research shows that the Hebrew writer was dead on. It is beneficial to us in more ways than one to sing praises to our God. Not secular songs. The chemical reaction within our bodies is incredible when we sing something larger than ourselves, singing in our faith in a great and merciful God. We're going to read the scripture, and so um, this is not the passage I will be expounding, but it is a passage that contains the verses that we expounded last Sunday morning, Hebrews 12, 14. Hebrews is written to Hebrews, Jewish people, who are contemplating leaving the faith because they have not considered the greatness of Jesus. And the mountains, the mountains that dot the Old Testament narrative versus the mountains that New Testament believers pursue. Hebrews 12, verse 14. The voice of God to the people of God for the faith of Christ. Verse 14. Work at living in peace with everybody. Working. Work at living a holy life. Because those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Thank you. I told his grandfather to poke him when 
I said it was worded. It worked. <laughs> Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of resentment, bitterness, grows up. That's unusual. Roots grow down. But this is, this is a root that grows up to pollute many people. This is why bitter parents produce bitter children, because it springs up and pollutes them. Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau, we're reading about him. He traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single bowl of beans. You know that afterwards, and we read about this last Sunday, this very scene, afterwards when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. There is such a word as rejection in the Bible. It was too late for repentance even though he begged for it with bitter tears. Now we come, as he says, to what mountain we don't come to. The story of the Bible is the story of one mountain to the next. If you know your Bible, it's the story of one mountain after the next, after the next, after the next. Genesis 1 and 2 begins on a mountain, and it ends on a mountain in Revelation 22. You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and the whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible, they begged God to stop speaking. Don't speak! They staggered back under God's command. Even if an animal touches the mountain, an animal, it must be stoned to death. Wow. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I'm terrified. I'm trembling. No. You all, the you is plural, as is most cases in our Bibles, but our English Bibles do not show that. You all have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to countless thousands of angels in joyful gathering. You've come to the assembly of God's firstborn children. Their names are written in heaven. You've come to God himself. He's the judge over all things. You've come to the spirits. This is about people who have died who know the Lord. You've come to the spirits of righteous people who are in heaven now who have been made perfect. That's a great hope, isn't it? You've come to Jesus. Notice how many times you've come, you've come, you've come, you've come, you've come. This is number six. You've come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people. You've come, here it is again, to the sprinkled blood. I got it through this. Uh, I'm tempted to pass it away, pass it, not pass it away, nope. pass by. This is the word sprinkle, it's Ron Tidzo. It means to sprinkle. And it's never used any time the word baptism is used. The word baptizo has never been translated in your English Bibles, unfortunately. What you have in your English Bibles is a, an invention. It's not a translation. It's an invention of a word that sounds like the Greek word. More on that some other day. But that's typical. Our English Bible translators do it all the time. Every single verse almost. There's verses that are invented for us to read. And it hides the meaning, unfortunately. You've come to the sprinkled blood, which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel, Genesis 4. When someone is murdered and the blood seeps into the ground, blood has a voice. Blood talks. What does it do? It cries out for vengeance, for justice. Because our world is ruled by a just God. And so be careful. This is the concluding paragraph. Be careful to not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. Because if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, and he was a very imperfect dude, 
He's an earthly messenger. We will not escape. Escape what? He says, we will not escape. We will not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke, there's that word, from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens as well. And this means that all of the creation will be, here's that word again, shaken, so that only unshakable things will remain. And since, here's the last verse, thank you for your patience. Since we are receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken, let us be thankful and what? Please God by worshiping Him. How? With holy fear. Remember he said without holiness no one will see the Lord? Without worship Him with holy fear and awe. Why? Why should we worship God with holy fear and awe? Why? Because our God is a devouring fire. We will not escape that fire unless we put it into practice. The voice of God speaking to the people of God for their faith in Christ. See. The good news here, uh, you can say amen to this if you like, is I have a clock here. And uh, it actually works. I have a clock in my bedroom at home. And it gains, it's an electric clock, and it gains two hours every day. I like it. So this morning, the clock said 3.30, I thought. So is it 5.30 or 1.30? I said, I don't know. I'll get up anyhow. It feels good to get up at 3.30. The coffee is much better at 3.30. Pray with me. Father in heaven, all over the world, people have gathered in time zones preceding us. The continent of Asia, Europe, Africa, the islands of the sea, they've met together. The gospel has been proclaimed, people have been changed. Your saints, your people have been trained for ministry. Your word has gone forth. We pray that now as it goes forth here and around the rest of the Eastern Standard time zone and the central and the western and the mountain, that there will be chains released, darkness pushed back with light, there will be forgiveness of sins, there will be people running to you, there will be stories of the prodigal son that come alive, people leaving the hog pen and coming to the Father's house, let that happen here if someone needs to do that. Whatever the need is sitting in this place, young or old, man or woman, boy or girl, even in the classroom with the children, do your will today in remarkable ways. Above all, may the spirit of the living Christ draw people to him with reverence and with awe and with love. I ask it for Jesus' sake. <clears throat> Years ago, um, a couple came to me with uh, some marriage problems. I didn't know them real well. I was new to the community and I uh, was blown away by what she had to tell me. They sat there together, and um, she told me in front of him that he was demanding in their marriage some things which were very degrading and humiliating to her. When she was saying those things, she had his head down like this, he wouldn't look me in the eye. So I said, well, what are those degrading things? I mean, what are we talking about? What is it that is so humiliating to you? And she told me about some of the things that he was demanding in their sexual life. I'd never heard of these things before. I mean, if he'd have given me LSD, I couldn't even have dreamed of these things. They were so weird and off the wall. And I could see how they would be humiliating and degrading.
to her as a woman. It objectified her as a woman and used her. And I said, yeah, you, you need to repent. This is not good. This is all about you. This is not about her. This is not an expression of love. And so I said, are you involved in viewing pornography? Is this where you get this stuff? He denied it. He said, no. I said, well, where did this come from? I've never heard of this. He didn't tell me. I really never found out where he got it from. But I said, this has got to stop. I said, because this lady here, your wife, is serious about the relationship, and I don't think that she probably wants to put up with it very much longer. So I had them come back in about a month later. I said, how are you doing? I said, well, he demands it. He won't stop. And I want to leave him. So I said, give me some time to think about this and consult with the elders without naming names. They concurred after meeting, discussing, without discussing the names of anybody. And so I said to the man, unless you desist, desist, desist from this and stop this, we will support her attempt to get a divorce from you. That shook him up a little bit. He didn't expect me to come down on him. And I noticed that afterwards, <clears throat> the way he would look at me and deal with me from time to time showed that he had a, uh, an attitude towards me. I could tell in his face. And then he began to do sneaky things, both against his wife and against me. He was holding a grudge against me. He was resentful. I had called him out. I had called him out on some stuff that never should have happened. And he refused to back down. So he held a grudge and was bitter against me and his wife. A grudge occurs when we have feelings of anger and resentment and bitterness towards something that we feel doesn't give us what we want or has mistreated us or in some other way. We use the word grudge when it goes on a long, 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 long time. And as we will see from some of Paul's teaching in the New Testament, when a man or a woman develops a grudge, they resent someone. It could be a school, it could be parents, it could be a child, it could be mom and dad, it could be a teacher, it could be a church leader. It could be even God. I know a lot of people who have harbored resentment against God because of something that happened in their life. Usually, two things happen when there's a long-held resentment and grudge. Number one, Paul tells us that you are opening the door up and inviting Satan to come in to start influencing your attitudes and putting poison in your relationships. I've seen that happen many times. It's a signal of satanic influence in a family, and usually that marriage will end in divorce. It's a signal that someone has made a decision, I'm going to be mad at God, I'm going to be mad at somebody, and I'm sticking with my guns. And it usually ends in divorce. And it ends up a man or a woman walking away from God. God did this, God allowed this to happen, and they resent God, and their spiritual life just goes, they have no joy in their life. Happiness? Oh yeah, but no joy. They don't like to sing. They don't like the word. They're just appetite for God plummets. This morning we're going to look at the case of Esau, who held a grudge against his brother. Right now I'm looking in Genesis, following up on a passage we encountered last week, I encourage you to follow along in Genesis chapter 27. I want to spend most of my time in the takeaways, but uh, last week we went chapter 27 verses 30 through 40. 
where we see Esau twice expressing bitterness, anger, and grief. Verse 34 of 27, when Esau heard his father's words, it says he screamed a great and bitter cry. He just realized that Jacob had stolen the blessing. Then at the end of the next paragraph, verse 38, Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me also, my father. I'm raising my voice because he's raising his voice. And then what? Here the writer includes another response. Esau lifted up his voice and sobbed. Here's a man who wanted something too late, but he was rejected by God. Here's where we begin our text this morning. Verse 41 through chapter 28, verse 5. Two paragraphs, but they hang together. What we're going to see here in 41 to 45 is anger and separation. Jacob won the battle for the blessing, but he incurred the wrath of Esau, and so his mother urged him to flee as a refugee for safety, and Jacob became a fugitive, and he never saw his mother again. In chapter 28, verses 1 through 5, which we'll look at for a few minutes, we see once again that Rebecca won the battle, just like Jacob won the battle. But she had to use a manipulative ploy to ensure Jacob's safety. She won the battle, but she lost the war. She was separate from her son, her beloved son. Never saw him again, ever. She won the battle because she was sneaky and deceptive and manipulative, but she lost the war. All right, let's go to 41. So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing which his father blessed his brother. <clears throat> Esau said in his heart, notice the response. When you have a grudge, then you make choices. When you have a grudge in your heart against somebody, you make choices, and those choices are like alcohol. It blurs your judgment. Any bitty person, any angry person, any resentful person, any man or woman who holds a grudge is like a drunk driver. Your judgment is impaired. You make choices, you make decisions in life that are unwise and usually lead to broken relationships. It's almost guaranteed. Notice what he said. The days of mourning for my father is near, then I will, your English Bible says kill, but that's not the word. It says, I will murder my brother. There are ten different words in our Hebrew Bible for kill. Ten different ones. For example, the Ten Commandments are often translated, thou shalt not kill. But that's not what it says. That's what your English Bible says. But there's ten different words for kill in order to help us to understand the nature of the killing. This is the word murder, like it is in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not murder. That is, to premeditate to kill somebody. It's different from the word I'm using, like for example, when David killed Goliath, the word murder is not used. So there's a specific word used of killing in battle. So Esau wants to murder his brother. Where'd that come from? A grudge. A grudge. What's a grudge? What's a grudge? It's when you feel that someone has wronged you. And you let it sit and simmer, listen to the voice of the enemy, and then you make plans. Now he's making a plan. Why does he want to kill? Because that's way that that's his way of punishing and getting even with Jacob. Find a man or a woman in a married relationship who feels they've been done wrong, and those who cannot forgive, they will what? They will adopt a choice meant to punish and get even spouse, or if it's a parent-child, or a child to a parent, or an employer-employee. It happens in school, it happens in churches, it happens in companies. You did this to me, I'll show you. So here is a pagan man, Esau, with a good set of parents who have their flaws, but he's pagan, and he has made up his choice to what? To murder his brother, fratricide.
as I mentioned before, when a man or a woman stoops to resentment and does not forgive, does not extend forgiveness and mercy to the wrongdoer, what happens? It's a signal that the relationship is going to end eventually. Um, I think it would maybe be good to uh, get some clarification on this whole idea of anger because the New Testament is very clear about two different kinds of anger. So if you have your New Testament, I want to grab mine here and look at some uh, words that are important to all relationships. In chapter 4, verse 25 of Ephesians, Paul says, Put off the lie and speak truth, each one to your neighbor. Why does he use the word neighbor? Because people that God, that God brings into your life, like all the people here, they're your neighbors. In our American understanding of the word neighbor, we think it's the people that live next door. Couldn't be further from the truth. Those people are not your neighbors because they're not involved in your life. Now, if they are, that's good. These are your neighbors. Your children are your neighbors. Your spouse is your neighbor. The people you work for, they're your neighbors. The people on the road to work this morning or on the way to church this morning, they were your neighbors for five seconds, 10 seconds, or 30 seconds. So Paul says, Speak truth to, to each man his neighbor <clears throat> because we are members, limbs. He uses the word body limb. We are limbs of one another. We all belong to a body and each of us is a limb. Need some glue here. Then he says, be angry. Anger is an emotion. But don't sin. Well, how is my anger going to turn into sin? Next phrase, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And neither, neither give the slanderer, the devil, a place to stand. Verse 31, let all resentment grudges, and then thumos, and then orge, thumos, and orge, and shouting, and blasphemy, or gossiping, be put away from you, along with all malice, become gracious to one another, compassionate, graciously forgiving each other, just as God and Christ has graciously forgiven you. I use the word gracious because that's the Greek word here. It's charizomai combined with the word to forgive. So graciously give, forgive each other. Just like God has graciously forgiven us. Now let me go back here. See the two words? Let all <coughs> resentment or grudge. And then thumos is from the Greek word thuain, meaning to boil. Have you ever heard the expression, he boiled over with anger? That's the explosive anger that people have. When they really get mad, they scream and shout. It's like a shotgun blast. Boom! And then in five minutes, they're calm and the life of the party. There's some other kind of anger. And it's the next word. Put away all resentment, explosive anger, and then orge. Orge is the deep-seated grudge that you hold against people. Your face puts on a smile, you go to a place, you go to a party, you go to church, and you're all smiles. But underneath, down below the surface, like a submarine, you harbor better feelings towards that person. Resentment. And you'd like to punish them in some way. You want to get even with them in some way. And Satan sees that. That's why he says, don't give them devil a place to sin. He sees that and he says, aha, there's an invitation for me to come into that person's life and do whatever I want. This is why forgiveness in a marriage relationship is not a good idea. It's essential. It's why parent-children relationships in terms of forgiveness is not a good idea. It's essential. It's the oil of relationships. 
so what is happening here to Esau? Esau is now under the influence of the enemy in a way he's never done before. Why? Because when he had a grudge against Jacob, the enemy comes in, sets up camp, and starts suggesting things. Yeah, why don't you, why don't you murder him? Get even. Look what he did to you. Am I speaking to people here who have a grudge against somebody? Is there someone here who is resentful towards God? Something he did to you? You know, I can predict that your relationship to him is going to go down if it's already not gone down and dead. Yeah. All right, let's, let's move here. The words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebecca. I wonder how. I don't know how she knew. She quickly sent and called for her younger son Jacob and said, Look, your brother Esau, she didn't say my son, your brother Esau is comforting himself. Isn't that funny? Comforting himself with respect to murdering you. Now then, listen to my voice. That word is only used for God. And she uses it herself. She uses this phrase when she speaks to her son. But it's only to be used for God. She's playing God. Arise, flee immediately to my brother Laban and Haran. Live with him for a few days while your brother's rage subsides. Stay there in Haran. It's about 500 miles away until your brother's rage against you subsides and he forgets what you... <laughs> Notice she fails to take responsibility for her own deception and manipulation. I mean, that's people that live in the flesh. There is a bad relationship here between husband and wife and mother and sons. She doesn't take full responsibility for her failure. By means of her manipulation and deception, she just basically planned a funeral for her relationship to Jacob. She will never see him again. Those few days that he was supposed to be gone turned into 20 years. She won the battle and lost the war. That's what deception and bad marriages are all about. They're not talking to each other. Why did Rebecca go to her husband and say, hey, you know what's happened? I heard that your son, our son, Esau's planning on killing our other boy. We've got to step in. But they're not talking. <laughs> that could have solved the whole problem. They could have said, Esau, we hear that you're planning on murdering your brother. Let's reconcile. Let's, let's figure this out. Let's work on it. Let's make the wrongs right. Let's work together. But here's a marriage. They're not talking to each other. In the next race, they talk to each other, but it's only out of a crisis. So, let's see what happens. Then Rebecca said to her husband, Isaac, first time that they've talked together throughout all these years. Ah, and notice she has a cover story to get Jacob out of Dodge. Jacob's in danger, we gotta get him out. But notice she doesn't tell him the truth. She doesn't say, Husband, our sons are about to kill each other. We need to sit them down and have a talk with them. She has a cover story. Here it is. She says, I, I loathe my life because of these Hittite daughters, or the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth, from the daughters of the land, the land of Canaan, I would rather die. It's a cover story. It's a cover story that might be true. It is. Any man or woman of faith, any husband or wife, mother or father, whose son marries a pagan. I mean, that is, that is so, so grief instilling. And see, what you need to understand is that if Jacob were to marry a woman from the land of Canaan, like Esau had done, she would not adopt the faith of her husband. But if Jacob went to the land of her brother Laban, then that wife would adopt his faith. And 
Rebecca has had enough trouble with these pagan daughters of Cain who basically use moral perversion to attract men. And so if Jacob had married a woman from that local community, it would have been the end of the covenant, humanly speaking, the end of faith. And he would have got sucked into that lifestyle. So she's desperate because she's not talking to her husband and the family's not talking together as a good, healthy marriage. She resorts to deception. And so dad goes along with the ride. He goes along with the scheme, even though he doesn't know about the murderous plans. So he called for Jacob, he blessed him, and he commanded him, you must not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. That's where they live. Arise, go to Padanera, go to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. Find yourself a wife there among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Both instances, Jacob won the battle for the blessing, lost the war. Rebecca won the battle for the blessing and lost the war. They never saw each other again. And what instigated the whole thing? Anger, the grudge, the grudge that Esau held against his own bride. So as I pondered this particular passage, a couple of things come to my mind by way of a takeaway. If you permit me, and I have sufficient time to do this, I'll go over a few takeaways that we might be able to put into our pocket, into our lives to give us hope as well as a pathway forward. A passage like this, a failure, of deception and lying on the part of people, people of faith, can be a great discouragement for those of us who believe in the kingdom of God. Why would God put up with such nonsense? <laughs> Why are some families so messy? Do you know some messy families? Do you know some families with messy relationships? Do you know some families that are just total chaos? That may have started well, ended down in the cesspool? Why does God stick with these people? As I said, it's easy to get discouraged when you read a passage like this. It's like, God, what are you doing? Couldn't you have chosen some better people to be a part of your covenant? Well, there is some hope here. There is some hope. God uses the mistakes and the sins and the deception and the lying and even the threat of murder by Esau. God uses those as tools to accomplish his sovereign plan. And he turns bad things into good things. He even uses the desperate fleeing of Jacob to accomplish his will so that Jacob eventually married a good woman named Rachel, who was a blessing to him. I'm glad today that our redemption and that God's plan of redemption does not depend, depend on my faithfulness. That's why we have a Savior who is faithful. I'm glad I can look to the year 2025 and 26 and 27 and the years beyond and not shiver in my boots and say, oh God, what are we going to do? God overrules and overrides the silliness, the messiness of Christian families. And yes, they will suffer. This family will suffer. We will all suffer for the mistakes we make out of anger, unforgiveness, resentment, and bitterness, manipulation, whether it's by a mom, a dad, or an in-law. People will suffer, and our children will be the innocent victims. That's going to happen. 
But God's ultimate victory depends on his mercy and his grace and his sovereignty. That's why we can trust this God. Praise God, it's not dependent on me and my faithfulness. Where would we be if God depended on my faithfulness for his kingdom to come? Let me move on to something else of uh, encouragement. And perhaps as a guiding post for some here. If you find a marriage today, young or old, where there's resentment, holding grudges, unforgiveness, refusing to reconcile, in-law interference, payback, get even, these are signs of poverty. These are signs of marriage poverty, spiritual poverty. You might know the Bible from cover to cover, but you are not a good example. And your children are innocent victims of this in a marriage relationship. These usually are the seeds that end up in some type of separation. For example, that man who I called out on degrading his wife, humiliating her. He thought, you know, if I leave, I'll do God's will somebody else. I'll find somebody who agrees with me. But as Jacob discovered, Jacob, who was a deceiver, he left and spent 20 years with his uncle, and he discovered that his uncle had a PhD in manipulation and deception. A change in geography does not solve a problem of character. Jacob took his problem with him and met someone who knew more about deception than he ever dreamed of. So if you think that a change in geography is going to do you good, no, you take your problems with you. And then God will set up another problem ten times worse, and your children will suffer as a result of it. This is why the New Testament is so emphatic about resentment and grudges and anger. It's a form of slavery. It is rooted in selfishness and life's all about me. So if you have a problem in, with resentment, anger, bitterness against God, against somebody in your family, a school, let us know. Let us help. Let us work with you to forgive, to reconcile, to make things right. Every day that you wait and procrastinate in this area, the harder it becomes. As we said last week, you judge the harvest by the blossom. If while you're young, you're given to resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness and unreconciliation, Chances are, 20 years from now, you'll be just the same old person. Unless we change when we're young, it is likely that we will never change. Take advantage of this opportunity today, this voice of the Lord, this meeting with God, to take care of this bond in your relationship. If you're newly married, forgiveness, taking responsibility for our failures, is of utmost importance, because it sets a groove in your and that you can follow that group all through the years of the ups and downs of childbearing. You know, life is far more stressful for you parents who have kids than for couples who have no kids. Life gets a lot tougher, a lot faster, a lot more misunderstanding possibilities. Learn the art of forgiveness while you can, while you have time. Last, as I thought about this passage and how Jacob now is going to get ready to go and flee as a fugitive from murder, from the anger of his brother, I thought, at least, at least though he never saw his mother again, 
and that relationship is dead. And his brother's about to kill him by being kicked out of his own house. He was able to meet God's choice of a wife for him, and he carried on the faith. And that's why today we can say God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and who else? Jacob. Praise God if you have chosen a spouse with a living faith. Praise God if you've chosen someone who is yoked together in Christ with you, regenerate by the Spirit of God. Praise God. Well done for making a choice to a woman or a man who believes in Christ the way you do. Otherwise, it could have been hard. This week I read, uh, once again, um, the autobiography, excuse me, the biography of both Lincoln, maybe not Lincoln, the 16th president, as well as General Ulysses Grant, Uncle Sam, I used to call him. <clears throat> Near the end of the war, three men gathered together to discuss how they were going to treat the South. One, because a month away, the South would surrender. And the three men got together and said, what are we going to do? What are we going to demand of them? What are we going to do with Robert E. Lee? What are we going to do with President Jefferson Davis? Are we going to put him on trial and hang him for treason? Many people in the North wanted to do that. These people rebelled against the flag. They rebelled against the Union. They rebelled against the Constitution. All traitors need to be hung. They wanted to hang Robert E. Lee, kill him, as well as President Jefferson Davis. Well, the three men were on the better mind. It was Lincoln, Grant, and Sherman. They met at a place called City Point. And at the meeting, Lincoln said he did not want to hang the Confederates so much as hang on to them. He says, I want no one punished. I want them treated liberally. We want those people to return their allegiance to the Union and submit to the laws. Grant agreed. He wanted to be magnanimous to them in terms of surrender. Let the soldiers keep their horses. Let them keep their guns so they can shoot crows with. What was unusual about all these three men? They held no grudges. No resentment towards people that fought against the very flag they defended. They were defending. No grudges, no resentment. And as a result, what happened? When Grant sat down, Grant sat down with Robert E. Lee at the Maddox Courthouse in April of 65, a month after that meeting with Lincoln and Sherman, he gave the most gracious terms of surrender. And Lee himself admitted that they would suit well to all of his soldiers. But the most impressive thing to me in reading about how forgiveness and leniency and mercy and grace can heal, heal, heal the nation that had been killing each other for four years was words spoken by a guy named James Longstreet. It's a funny last name. I guess it's better than Short Street. James Longstreet. He was a Confederate general. He was portrayed in that movie against which I'm sure all of you saw. And he saw the terms of surrender, not at that meeting, but later on, and heard about how Grant had been so generous and magnanimous and forgiving of the entire army. And he said, good, or great God, why do men fight each other who are brothers? And he made comments that never in the field of any kind of historical conflict had the enemies of the people been treated so kindly and so graciously. And what happened? The union returned to one. That's what I'm suggesting this morning. That for everybody in a relationship, a future relationship, if in any way you're given to resentment because your parents resented each other, they fought with each other, argued with each other, and never made things up. If that was your model, it's not a good model. 
I'm not disrespecting your parents. I'm suggesting that the model that we're given is God, who for Christ's sake forgave us, even though we had raised our fist in his face. And that picture of Calvary, of Christ on the cross, says, I forgive you. I forgive you. Is that characteristic of our relationships here? I hope it is. May God give us grace and mercy. It has nothing to do with resentment. Nothing to do with bitterness. Nothing to do with unreconciliation. Thank you for listening. Let's close this message with a prayer if you will stand. Father in heaven for giving us examples both bad and good, positive and negative, ones that we want to avoid, ones that we want to emulate in the scripture. You don't leave out the bad stories, and you don't leave out the bad people, and you don't leave out the bad plans, and you don't leave out things like attempted murder, fratricide. You stick them in there our benefit, for us to see what's going to happen to our relationships when we hold grudges and open our lives up to Satan. I know he's looking in every relationship in this room, whether it's a person's relationship to you or to people's relationship <laughs> as mom and dad to each other, husband and wife, parent and child brother and sister, employer, employee. Let him find no cracks here. And if there are cracks, please heal them. Please repair the cracks and rebuild strong walls of reconciliation. Let every child in this, represented in this room, every child, teenager, elementary school, kindergarten, college, let them see the father and mother who are joyful, who are happy together, who love each other, who forgive each other, giving them an example and let it carry on to the next generation. If there's an Esau in the making here, speak to his heart. If there's a Rebecca here, speak to her. If there's an Isaac here, speak to him. And if there's a sneaky Pete, Jacob, speak to him and give them ears to hear what the Spirit says. I pray for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> this is face time. God putting his face shining on us and the book of Numbers tells us that when God shines his face upon us through the blessing, he puts his name upon us. Now go and carry that name in a way that's a credit to your Savior. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his face towards you and give you peace. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen.